Welcome to the Dandelion Effect podcast, a space for organic conversation about the magic of living a connected life. Just like the natural world around us, we are all linked through an intricate web, a never-ending ripple that spans across the globe. Here, we explore the ideas that our guests carry through the world, remember who and what inspired them along the way, and uncover the seeds that help them blossom into their unique version of this human experience. This podcast is a production of the Feather Pipe Foundation, whose mission is to help people find their direction through access to programs and experiences that support healing, education, community, and empowerment. Welcome back to another episode of the Dandelion Effect podcast. I'm your host, Andy Van Treese. And before we get into our guest today, I just want to thank you for tuning in week after week as we share conversations that aim to spark inspiration and really reach into the depths of the human experience. Please keep sending in your thoughts, feelings, and feedback so we can know how this content is landing in your hearts. Today, I'll share a review from Carlos in Long Beach, California. He says, it's refreshing to listen to a podcast telling real stories of mindfulness making an impact on issues in today's turbulent climate. The dandelion effect is raw, it's inspiring, and I just love it. Thanks so much, Carlos. And for all of you listening and sending in reviews, it totally lights me up to hear from you. So please keep sharing. Today, I speak with Chocho Lewin. Chocho is the co-founder and chair lady of Studer Trust, an organization dedicated to building educational facilities and providing proper equipment to schools in Southeast Asia, specifically in the remote regions of Myanmar. As the former country manager for Studer Trust, Chocho spent over a decade traveling back and forth from the United States to Myanmar every three months to oversee the school projects, a passion for education that stems from overcoming the cultural and societal obstacles in her own childhood in Mandalay, Myanmar. Chocho has always been a revolutionary soul, and you'll be able to tell this right away. Having grown up in a male-dominated culture and lived through several military government regimes, she rebelled against the traditional systems really early on and paved her own life path, running away and marrying her high school sweetheart, Bobo, getting an education and growing a career in the travel industry, then moving to the United States in 2006 to provide her daughters with the freedoms she desired and knew she deserved throughout her life. Her ties to the Feathered Pipe Ranch and to Montana happened serendipitously, as so many of ours do. Chocho was working as a travel agent in Myanmar when she met Vijay Supra, India Supra's sister, and John P. Anderson, a longtime friend of the ranch and a resident of Missoula, Montana. I'll let her tell you the story, but let's just say meeting these two travelers rerouted her entire immigration plan, and instead of moving to New York City, like they originally intended, BJ and John P. helped her move her family to Missoula, Montana, with a warm welcome from the community and plenty of friends upon arrival. Chocho's life story is one of sass and stubbornness, courage and strength, mixed in with an endearing sense of humor that carries her through the hard times. We talk about her childhood heroes, the women who showed her it's possible to rise above the stifling sexist rules, and taught her the importance of speaking up for herself and speaking out for what she believed will lead to a better world. We also touch on the current situation in Myanmar following the military coup a few weeks ago, an ongoing battle for power that she's all too familiar with. Without further ado, please enjoy this conversation and help me welcome my friend, Chocho Luin. So where I want to start with this, Chocho, is I really want to get into your childhood as a woman in a country that is a very male-dominated culture. Um, in Myanmar, Mm -hmm. where women and girls were not allowed to do many things. I mean, I know you've mentioned not being able to tap your hands or feet to make music or not being able to climb a tree or not allowed to go anywhere alone. There's so many things that were built in when you were born. And, you know, I'm really just curious of what your first memory was of realizing that you were a girl and that with that came an entirely different set of rules for you in your childhood. I was born around uh, 1975 and I grew up in Mandalay, which is the second largest city of Myanmar. And we have four siblings. I am the eldest daughter and then my sister and then my brother and my younger sister. So 
most of the family in Myanmar are the Buddhist family and husband is usually the head of the family and decision maker, where the woman usually manage households and help the husbands. At the young age, I remember there were many things that I won't be able to do it because both of my parents, they would say, well, this is not for you. You are a girl. You cannot climb up. Or sometimes even you cannot uh, smile very openly because it's considered as it's not appropriate. So if I look back all of my old pictures, all my smile were not very open. So the boys get the favor of the family. Example, like when we were young at night, we won't be able to allow play when my brother was playing with his friends because uh, that's not appropriate for the girls to go out and play. Anyway, we we have a, a bunch of girls group that at night we sneak around and then play in mm. this, uh, <laughs> my father's longi, because girls' longi are also, again, considered not appropriate to be seen in the public. Do you remember having that feeling of rebellion pretty early on? At home, I get the most punishment because there are many times that I say no to my mom, especially, Mm -hmm. because I said, that's not fair. Why? Coco is my brother's name, and he he never get to do this. Um, Example, my mom would say, oh, you need to clean up. After everybody is eating, you have to clean it up because I am the girl and I'm the eldest. And I would say, no, that's not fair. Why go go can carry his plate and he should clean up his dish. And then I would get punishment. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and there were many times and many conversations that I against my, my parents and very close to my mother because she stayed at home and looking after the family while, while my my dad would probably go out and do a lot of uh, his businesses. And my mom, most of the time, we always ran into a very serious uh, conversation. But, you know, there are a few things also when I realize when I'm getting older, some of my friends, their parents were a little bit modernized thinking way than, especially than my mother. Because my mom's education was very limited. She just finished the minimum elementary school level. She'd be able to read and write only. She didn't even know all the English alphabet. So that's also um, because of the education she received. She won't be able to give us better judgment. And also... From the protective way, she feels that the girls can be targeted very easily Mm -hmm. if you go out or you do some inappropriate things because they can easily pick on you and then bully. But I wish I could get much freedom like my brother when I was little. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's such an interesting point about your mother. And I think that it sounds like as you got older and um, started to recognize why your parents were the way that they were. I mean, I think that's something that we all go through as we grow up and trying to understand why our parents made certain decisions and did certain things. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of times it's out of protection, you know, or out of fear. And it's interesting to hear that the level of education that your mother had gotten played a part in Uh, your view of her ability to really grant you that empowerment or that freedom that I'm sure she wanted for you, but perhaps didn't know how to give because that hadn't been her life experience. Yeah. I mean, my, my mother life was also very interesting. She grew up with uh, most of the time with stepmother who was very abusive And also my mom and my dad, marriage was arranged. They only got to know each other one month before their wedding day. Is that common? Oh, it's very common, yes. I mean, when the girls wanted to get married, it's usually your boys, whoever you're going to marry, needs to be approved by your parents especially. 
my parents had so much dreams about me and everything. But my mom always said, you are a rebellious person that I ever seen or the stubborn girl. Why don't you just go and do what I requested? And she, she said, why you have to challenge our authorities or why you wanted to break traditional uh, rules um, like, oh, uh, Chucho, do this because this is a girl. And I said, why I have to do? So these are the very often uh, answers and questions that my mom received. And I think Mm -hmm. at that time, sometimes she's getting tired of me. (laughs) (laughs) Do you feel that you were just born with that fire, that spirit of, no, I'm going to do things differently? Was it just built in? I think probably I was born with that, but also, I mean, what I've seen uh, throughout my life and especially at the young age of why we can't go into that particular place in Bagoda because we are the girls. Well, this is a traditional belief and norm. It doesn't make any sense to me. So I think I was born with that, but building up by seeing a lot of things, these are to me unfair to a girl in Myanmar. Mm-hmm. And then why the boys usually get a lot of freedoms and why we were, were not. A huge topic of conversation now is representation and the idea that if people can't see people that look like them, that are part of their community doing certain things, it's really hard to imagine yourself mm-hmm. able to do those things. Was there anybody that you looked up to or admired or thought she's doing that? Maybe I can Mm -hmm. do that. Or just those little sparks of inspiration along the way that could be very influential for a young girl. Yes, yes. I have a few heroes. So there is an auntie who lived across from our place and she was educated and she graduated with a bachelor degree. And she was working as a government staff that time. Every time my mom would spank me, the lady that I told, uh, her name is Andy Mio, which we, I call it, Andy Mio and her brother, who is also a teacher at that time. And they would take me to their house and they would talk to my mother like, this is not a right way to punish the girl. And, you know, she also should have some freedom. And they encourage me in many ways. Mm-hmm. And so Andy Mio was definitely one of my first very hero because she was educated. She was working that time. She got her freedom. She rode her bicycle alone to the office, you know. And so she was def- definitely my hero. And then our another neighbors, a little bit older than me, her mother was a teacher. Her dad was the university teacher at the University of Mandalay at that time. They got quite a freedom than me. You know, they have to do their chores, but it's not really like majority of the mothers at that time. They were a little different, and I saw the freedom that they got. So those were the people that I looked up to. And Andy Mio died 10 years ago, but the other girl that older than me, I mentioned, now she become a professor at a medicine school. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm always so curious. And nobody is self-made. Each generation, that's how culture is created. That's how traditions are created. It's just people doing certain things. Mm -hmm. And if you want to change it, you are that change. So it's really interesting to hear who gave you those sparks. Yes, yes, definitely. These are the people. And of course, as I get older and our ladies, Aung San Suu Kyi, who got arrested two weeks ago, um, she was our state councillor and had been fighting for freedom and democracy for our country. So she is my lifetime hero. And after I moved to United States, I really like our Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, mm-hmm. and I really like her very much too. Definitely. It's fun to have those people in, in your life who you are in relationship with, but then also those bigger figures who mm-hmm. are doing work on such a high level that 
we can all admire from afar because it's so relevant to our lives. Yes, and make a lot of important changes for the people and majority for the women. So Mm -hmm. I want to talk about your relationship with your husband, Bobo, because I think that this relationship is kind of a revolutionary love in the way that it (laughs) has transpired just the conditioning that you were born into and having been a part of a culture where arranged marriage was very common and you did things much differently in that arena of life as well yes knowing I did (laughs) knowing that you met (laughs) Bobo in high school and just tell us a little bit about what that relationship was like when you were still living in Myanmar and perhaps What did all that mean for you in your lifetime of kind of rebelling against these larger systems? Bobo and I have been married for 28 years. I met him at one of our out-of-school classes in uh, around 1990 and 91, when we were still in high school. And I went to um, all-girls school. I mean, it's no wonder my parents put me in (laughs) our sister in all-girls school. And they put our brother in all-boys school. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Not in our normal school, but it is a tuition where we need extra help with the teacher. So we went to this tuition and I met Bobo there. And of course, when my parents found out that I was in a relationship, they got furious. And I remember that many times my mom told me I could only get two dresses because if I had many dresses that I can change, I would probably have ego and pride. And then this is what made me to have boyfriend. Wow. And- <laughs> Yeah, they were very conservative. (laughs) Wow, yeah. That I will not be very attractive or, Mm -hmm. you know, and I will not look good and I will not get boyfriend or that will probably lower my intention of having boyfriend. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And every Mm -hmm. time I wanted to stand next to the window also, they think I'm trying to lure the boys that I wanted to have a lot of boyfriends. Yeah, there were many... Funny things that my parents thought in that time. I mean, when Bobo and I were in relationship, of course, we didn't have plan to get married right away. We had our plan and I was very keen to be educated person because of the people that I have seen, my heroes when I was young. So I wanted to get graduated. I wanted to get degrees from the university and I wanted to work and I want to have a life. Mm -hmm. and family, of course. Uh, But the married at a young age wasn't my first choice. But my parents put me into it. (laughs) What do you Uh, mean? uh, So one day in full day of July 1992, uh, my parents and a few of our relatives went to a monastery and make a donation of offering food to a lot of monks. And that time I I sneaked out and then I was just sitting and talking with Bobo like for a few hours. And then my parents at some point, they noticed that they could not find me. Then they started looking for me, which I didn't know that. When I went back to the monastery, I noticed that dad was very angry and my mother too. So they actually took me to a corner place and then my dad was really angry. He questioned me, where did I go? We went home because the monastery was in Zagai, which is about one hour drive from Mandalay. That evening, my dad and my mom, they tore my clothes and they slapped me. And again, they got me the punishment with this two dress again they said mm-hmm. you were going to put you again with these two dress rules and you're not allowed to wear any value ever things because the boys might think I'm rich and this is I become a target and this all kinds of things they making that talking to me again and I was so afraid of course I'm trying to 
lie that as much as I could that no, I was out with my friends, girlfriends, who was in this place or who was in that place, and my parents did it by my lie. So they said, okay, tomorrow morning we're going to go and check it out with your friends,、Uh-oh. and then <laughs> yeah, then. I I said okay, and with the clothes that it was torn, I actually went to my friend's place where I mentioned her name earlier to my parents, saying that I was with her, and I went to her place, which was about five、uh, blocks away from our house. The reason was okay. The next morning,、um, if they showed up, you say I was with you. But then, by the time I reached to her house and already had a conversation, which she agreed to say anyway if they showed up the next day, and I thought, and it was too late, and I actually came back, but I saw there were so many things happening. Means a lot of people, my relatives nearby our house, and I knew that they probably noticed again that they could not find me, so. What I did is I、um, went to a Bobo place. He was staying at his friend's house. I just wanted to tell Bobo what's going on. Then when I reached to Bobo place, and we were talking different things, and of course crying, and they, he saw me with in the clothes that was already tear apart. Both of us at that time was. Well, what should we do? We will not be able to see each other again the rest of our lives, you know. So then Bobo said, "Oh, let's go run away." And I then I said to myself, "Yeah, why not? Maybe I can just get some freedom too." So this is why we ran away to Piulin, which is a hill station about an hour drive from. Mandalay and with his motorcycle, and we got all together at that time. Money we got in hand was about ten cent in U.S. dollar money, eleven jets. And when we were started to climb up at the hill station by motorcycle,、uh, we usually a traditional way of believing we needed to offer a spiritual house a flower. So we offer flower for ten jets, and we have the bill of one. Jet in Myanmar currency left, which we both signed with the date, and we kept it until now. Wow, what a story! Yeah. Oh, then ceremonies for boys for my brother and us too.、Uh, it is called Shinpyu or、uh, Buddhist Novitiation Ceremony was held three months before I ran away. Me and my all my sister were also be, we became nun for a month, which means I shaved my hair. So when I eloped it with Bobo, my hair was very very short. So after I've been with Bobo for a little bit over a month or two months, my hair grew a little bit longer. I remember I told Bobo that I wanted to curl my hair. I wanted to make wave. Mm. And he said it will not look good on you. And I said no, I am going to do it because every time I requested to my mother to cut my hair or do however I want it, she said no, I'm not allowed.、Mm-hmm. So this is my freedom. If you say I can't do it and I'm not going to marry you, I have to do it. I must do it, and I did it. <laughs> And I look very ugly too. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't even matter. It was just the act. Yeah. yeah. So it's really interesting to me because wanting your freedom and wanting to just have the autonomy to live the life that you wanted to live as a human and as a woman, and、mm-hmm. how you found that through a union with a man, Bobo. He was such a yeah, my sweetheart, and he allowed me to do everything that I wanted to do since day one. He supported me in many ways. Yes, I wanted my freedom, but I also loved Bobo very, very much, and I did not believe in、um, an arranged marriage. 
I don't want to be a person who was told to do things. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to contribute something into in a conversation or in a life together. Bobo was able to come to United States as a legal immigrant. Also, we did it together. So every step since then, we did it things together. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, tell me about what that transition was like. I'm curious of how your family accepted or didn't accept what you had decided to do together and, and how did you have the opportunity to come to the U.S.? Of course, my parents, especially my dad, they didn't accept my marriage. He actually told everybody as soon as I ran away that I died. He was very upset. I mean, I understand because he was arranged already for me to be a university student, to attend it in university. I was a very bright student. I passed the high school with what we call three distinctions. So he was very upset. He did not even talk to my husband until our first daughter was born in 1994. Mm. After, I think, more than six months, I was living with my in-laws, okay. with my husband. Then my mom actually wanted me to get back to our house. But my father, he did not. But anyway, my mom was really worried about me being in another place. And she's been convincing my dad to take me. So she was talking to my dad and he accepted on one condition that me and my husband won't be at his side. He didn't want to see us. He loved his first granddaughter very much, but he still could not take it, my husband, as his son-in-law. Mm. After our first daughter was a year or so old, I got my very first job as a bar hostess at the uh, very first international hotel in Mandalay. Mm. My working hours was very late hours. You know, sometimes we have to walk walk until midnight or after midnight. And I remember, you know, how in Myanmar, the traditional norms and belief of, well, if you see a woman after midnight, that she, she... will not be a good woman. It is mm. a loose character. It's only the woman who has a loose character can stay up uh, until midnight or odd hours. I was earning a lot of good money, and my husband at that time was studying as an engineering student. I wanted to support and I wanted to get some income. So I worked there and happily, and it was a good pay job. But one day my mom, told me that I should quit my job because a few women from our community concerned about what I'm doing. Mm. And they thought that I was a, a prostitute. I earn any money on that. Also, my mom that maybe you should quit the job uh, because I don't want to be seen as a mother of loose character by my community. And I mm. was, what? told my mom that, no, I will not quit my job. This is my job. I like it. And no matter how other people think, I like it and it support my family. And um, it's not what other people think at no, all. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. And my mom was, you know, she felt so sad about the whole thing. Even a few of our relatives, they came to our house whispering and to my mom uh, that she should convince me to quit my job. So my mom felt that she wasn't a good mother because she won't be able to convince me as usual. And from there, I just built up my career as a travel uh, consultant. And this is how I met Vijay and John P. Anderson from Missoula. And uh, from there, I uh, become um, a country director of Student Trust uh, nonprofit organization. And I strongly believe that education can change one person's life. Mm-hmm. And the, this is also 
uh, it's the very reason that me and my husband, uh, we moved to United States here as a legal immigrant. Well, you... Because of our daughter's education. Mm-hmm. 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 Wanting to give them that opportunity. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Will you tell me um, a little bit more about meeting Vijay Supra and John P. Anderson? It was sometimes in 2005 where I was working as a travel consultant at a company in Myanmar. And my husband at that time, we knew that he was one of the winners for the U.S. Green Card Lottery program. And we were in preparation of getting into United States, the whole family. Mm -hmm. And of course, we didn't have uh, no friends or family members here in the state. Except for me, the the rest of the family never been out of the country. I was that time already involved with the um, nonprofit organization, which building schools and promoting educational opportunities in Myanmar. So because of this organization, I was invited to go to Hong Kong uh, for a few days. So I had a little bit of international experience, but the rest of my family, they had none. And... So our plan was we uh, got this um, New York address through one of our mutual friends, but the house owner, we didn't really know. But we used her address uh, for the correspondent for our green card uh, application and program. So when VJ and uh, John P actually came to the office, they wanted to make the payment bought the service through our company. And when they showed up, it was really funny that I let them sit down and then talk through it. And I was needed a copy of the uh, passport. And I found out that they were Americans and we started talking about our plan of going to the U.S. And we said, oh, we probably sent my husband to New York first, and then we will follow. And this is where uh, VJ said, oh, no, no, Chocho, you you don't want to send your husband alone. And my husband was in my office that time. He did very little communication with VJ and John, and they know that it it wasn't a good idea for my husband Mm -hmm. to go to a big city like New York. And without knowing anybody there, or no family. So we, we just started the conversation. And at some point, John P said, well, why don't you go and stay in our family place in Missoula, Montana? <laughs> and <laughs> it was just like that. Uh, Were you and, like, um, where is that? Yeah, <laughs> no. Yeah, exactly. We're like, what? Mon- Montana? Is it a place in U.S.? Does it exist? <laughs> <You know? laughs> because, yes, we, we heard about New York, uh, California, San Francisco or something. Montana? No. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, this is how we came to Missoula, Montana, and we really liked it very much. People are very warm, welcome, and we got a very overwhelming support from the friends from VJ and John P, family friends, everyone. Mm-hmm. Uh, because of them, it, we be able to make a small settlement in Missoula, and we like it very much. Mm-hmm. How old were your two girls when you came over? They were six and a half and 12 and a half. Okay. And they are already 21 and 27. Hmm. It's such a different upbringing for them and a different life for them. What has it What has it been like for your family um, since coming here to the U.S.? Just in a sense of changing those generational patterns and allowing your daughters the freedoms that you wished that you had. Oh, yes, definitely. It's an eye opening for everybody. I would say it's a good change for the whole family. You know, when we came, we had only 1,300 US Mm. dollars. That's all we we had at that time. Mm. And 
me and my husband Bobo, we work very hard, and as the girls too, they supported us in many ways. Because how we moved here is totally different traditions and the culture and norms, but it's a very best thing that we could do it for them and us too. They are now educated women, very independent. We don't have to worry about anything at all because we know that they are very strong and they can take care of themselves. And our elder daughter is graduated from University of Montana, and she is now working at the uh, Missoula Development Services for almost three years. And Susu is studying pharmacy Mm -hmm. at the University of uh, Montana. So we're very proud. And because of here, the society and uh, freedoms and rights for the girls, they be able to become who they are now. Mm-hmm. I know when we talked last, you you were telling me about some of the ways that your daughters have been teaching you yeah. and, <laughs> and being the reflectors that children can be, um, just showing you some of the ways that those generational patterns, the more of the fear-based living, you know, that you grew up with, how that still lives in you. And so this next generation that you are raising is responsible just as you were for Mm -hmm. uh, pushing you outside of your comfort zone (laughs) and for saying, no, mom, this isn't how it has to be. Can you give an example or just talk a little bit about that? Yeah, definitely. We were grew up with this uprising in 1988, and there was many crackdown, and many people got arrested and tortured by the system for them students more than two decades. They were in prison. So I myself, I not all the time, but at some point, I grew up with some kinds of fear too. I got involved in uprising. But uh, there was a time that I was so scared of speaking up um, even uh, little things. Example, if they wanted to get a conversation about the news about radios just announced in the evening about little political stuff, I would not be able to comfortable about talking it because I was too scared seeing that some of my cousins got arrested and they were put in jail for many years or some of the businesses who they got involved also uh, shut down by the military government. So after we moved here, there were a few times that, you know, I just assumed that, oh, you can't talk about this. I would ask Susu a lot of questions of my daughters, but especially to Susu because she got involved in many activities. And sometimes I was scared. A good example would be when she got involved with speech and debate, and there was many times they would change some system that they changed. Mm -hmm. And they said, oh, we're going to talk to the board. And I was, oh, well, do you think it's a good idea that you get involved? (laughs) Mm -hmm. And Susu will say, oh, it's okay that we can speak it up. And one time she said, oh, mom, you might want to speak with other parents to talk about. That was in Paxson School when she was in in elementary. Want to get involved of uh, something about the classroom management and things like that. Mm -hmm. I was a little skeptical about getting involved because I thought, Maybe it's not a good idea to speak about it, but Susu would say, no, you can get involved. Or sometimes I say, Susu, you should not go there. And she would say, mom, remember, you didn't like what you were told not to (laughs) by grandma, but you have to let us do it. Some of the stuff, example, she would say, oh, I wanted to go out with my friends or sleep over. Sometimes I was a little worried about how, which I should not be, but it just comes, I think, as a traditional, hidden cultural, how can I say, the Bambis, 
uh, way of thinking. It just comes out. But then mm-hmm. Susu would remind me like, no, you don't want to be like grandma, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's probably a really easy way for her to to allow yeah. her to do something. <laughs> yes. But there were many things that we learned about American culture and the family values. And what you do as a family time fun playing games because in Myanmar, we don't usually play games or singing together because they were not in our traditional way. There were many things that we learned through our daughters. Mm -hmm. And I think remember one time Susu told us, maybe you should get parenting classes. And then (laughs) we went, Bobo and I went there (laughs) when Susu was already, I think, 10 years old. And we were sitting with a bunch of parents. Their kids were two years old or five years old. (laughs) (laughs) But, you know, the parenting in Myanmar, I mean, probably nowadays through internet, the young generation, they probably learn a lot. But when we were, I never heard about parenting tips, Mm -hmm. parenting uh, uh, classes or book about parenting. No, you were told what the parents want you to do. Susu will say, this is all. No, I don't want to eat broccoli. And my parents would use, this is what we cook. This is what you eat. It's something yes. like that. But in a we use in um, Myanmar manners, and we learn you can have a good principle, but this should be in a good conversation with your children, which we learn a lot through our daughters mm. from their school and through their friends that they hang out a lot or they want for our sleepovers, and they learn a lot, and they will say. You can say no, but in such a nice way. Yeah. And yeah, that we learned. And I wish my mom could have that too. <laughs> mm-hmm. Is your mother still alive? Stay alive. Is she in the States with you all or is she in Myanmar? She is now in Myanmar, but she came to US and lived with us for already three or four times. It was eyes opening for my mother too. She changed a lot and... There were many times that with her granddaughter, she said, no, Susu, you cannot go. And Susu said, no, Grandma, I can go. This is just play day. I can go and I can play whoever I wanted, something like that. And my mom said no. And then she learned a lot, too, about how here in U.S. or in Western country that how they raise their kids to be independent But there are certain things that you can say no in such a good way. What are some of the things that you carry over from having grown up in Myanmar? Some of the cultural traditions that you respect and want to instill in your daughters or preserve? We really wanted our daughters to carry on respect. In our country, when having a dinner, we usually offer the first food to the elderly people mm-hmm. who sitting in the dining table. So we told our daughters that they should carry on because they were like, oh, I'm the youngest. You should give me first the best food mm-hmm. <laughs> because the youngest is kind of the weakest person you, we should be looked after. But in Myanmar way is we give a respect to elderly people first. Because of them, because of what they supported to us, we be able to grow up. And this is how we give a respect. So this is one thing that we strongly form. So when we eat, our daughters, they, even with their boyfriend, they will say, oh, yeah, put it to our dad's plate first. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. And also, there were many things that um, in Myanmar, when we grew up, it was not available. So we have to use whatever we could. Yes. Not, I mean, here in U.S., is, it was great that we have t- available many things. But sometimes I think we easily uh, wasted mm-hmm. um, because of in Myanmar, there were uh, times that container of uh, milk we we use it but the container we stay carry using for measuring cup 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So yeah, (laughs) even if it's something very little, appreciate what you have. Yeah. So just taking the things from your upbringing that you want to preserve and that you feel are positive values, but then changing and being open to other ways of doing things in other aspects of life. Yeah. Yeah. And so you came to the U.S. in 2006. Were you working for Studer Trust when you came here? Mm -hmm. I was working for Studer Trust part-time in 2006. It's Studer Trust is a nonprofit organization that is registered in Hong Kong. And primarily, we promoting uh, educational opportunities in disadvantaged uh, area and communities in Myanmar. At this moment, we already built almost 70 schools building in Myanmar, along with other projects. Mm-hmm. And we received many support from Hong Kong and also from Missoula, Montana, and also from uh, other countries. Sura Trust is founded by a gentleman called Peter Gauchi, uh, who he is a, a Swiss nationality, but he had been living in Southeast Asia, particularly in Hong Kong for many years. And the idea was he wanted to give back, empower the young people with better education for them. Mm-hmm. And I met him uh, accidentally in 2004 uh, while I was working as a travel consultant in Myanmar. And later I got very much involved with Studer Trust and I became a country manager and I managed until uh, up to 2018. I'm still getting involved as a chairperson and the co-founder and I wish to continue to doing it so Education is very important, and I believe in myself. And the reason we moved to United States is for our daughters, better education. This mm-hmm. is why I wanted to get involved mm-hmm. uh, in Student Trust. And 2015, group of uh, volunteers from Missoula, Montana, through Episcopal Church, we organized it with Student Trust. They went to Myanmar for two weeks. And they live in uh, monastic schools and they help students and teachers teaching English. Mm. And they stay uh, supported uh, other projects like getting electrical power at one of the monastic school, uh, dental clinic at one of the monastic school and sponsoring uh, a few girls to continue their study. Mm. Before 2018, you were going back and forth to Myanmar quite frequently, right? Every yes. three months or so? Yes. Um, yeah. Did, I commute a lot. Yeah. I imagine that where you were building the schools and where you were doing the projects were in more remote areas. Yeah, I was traveling a lot because all of our projects are all over Myanmar to go and visit that project. And me and my team, we would need and see with a lot of communities, especially in a remote area. In past three years, we decided to focus on an area which needed the most in Myanmar. Before, we built school all over Myanmar, but past five years, our Focus area is the poor state of Gaya, Isambul, Chin State, uh, Nagatland, Shan State, and so on. Okay. Um, and especially when I uh, travel, and of course, uh, I see a lot of poor communities that needed help with education and many basic infrastructure. Well, what happening now in Myanmar is also not helping at all to those people living in poor condition. Yeah, I was going to ask just what that feels like mm-hmm. to you to go back and then now to see what's going on in your country. I'm sure you have a lot of relatives still there and things are um, getting dangerously close to what you grew up under as far as yes. military regime. You know, since uh, Monday, the February 1st, um, 
including our state councillor and uh, many civil political leaders, they were arrested. And believe it or not, she was arrested and charged for having walkie talkies. What? <laughs> that's what, yes, that's what military government usually what they does. They always came up with this stupid uh, reasons when arresting people. What's happening now in Myanmar is getting back to the control under the military government. It's not going to help the people at all. And this is where a lot of demonstration and protests are happening on the streets and is increasing every day. And I heard that as we speak, a few hours ago in Mandalay, two people got shot and killed. And I hope they stop and that they uh, return the power back to our elected government. I witnessed what happened in 1988, and again in 2007, we call it a Saffron uh, Revolution. And there were many corrupted systems. This is why we built many schools in remote area. With the team, they would scout which school needed. And before 1994, the only place that we could get the education was in public school. Okay. If your area, they don't have a public school, and your children won't be able to get education. So the monastery and the monk, they stepped in and they gave this free education. Mainly is the children be able to read and write and learn a simple or basic mathematics subject. Mm -hmm. And from there, uh, 1994, they... The government legalized the monastery school, and, and from there it's growing. And when we built our first school in 2004, this is where I learned the real situation of the education status in the villages. Mm -hmm. Most of the monastery school that time, I was talking about back in 2004, didn't get any support from government. They were just relying heavily relying on the donations from community. Okay. Today, we had about uh, 1,800 monastery schools across the Myanmar. Wow. Yeah. Of course, since the, the ladies' party, uh, people got, the NLT party got elected in 2015 and they uh, got into the office and there, things were much improved. There were many public schools that have been built in remote area. And this is where nowadays we work also closely with Ministry of Education. And I had a one experience when we were doing a school opening ceremony at one of the monastic schools at the northern part of Mandalay at a village called Changji. And it, that was in 2006. I was with two foreigners from Hong Kong. Uh, one was our donors, one, one uh, he was our executive officer of Sri Trust. And then immigration officer came and for no reason, they just wanted to uh, get some money because they questioned me, giving me a very I mean, stupid and very hard question, which is not nothing related to our project or me, but they thought they give me very hard questions. I would probably give him a lot of money and then, you know, just to keep them shut down. But instead, I did not do. I just sat down and then I talked with them for almost four hours. Oh, my gosh. And they were like, what was the reason you built the school? What is behind it? What's your organization doing? Did you wish to do the businesses at this village? Who gave you the permission? Of course, I answer all those questions. And I said, well, this is for the people. And we have no intention of doing businesses. I mean, we also brought dentists from Mandalay 
give a free dental treatment to everybody who came for the opening ceremony. Because in Myanmar, one seeing or having or getting to know or touching the foreigner is also a privilege. So there was a lot of villagers came just to see uh, mm -hmm. the foreigners. So we give a free a dental treatment on the opening ceremony day. So we have no intention. Uh, the only good intention is to help and uplift community by providing a proper school building because the children were studying under the rain. You know, in Myanmar is once they squeeze and give a very hard questions, people easily got fear and they will say, oh, okay, what should I do, officer? It just simply, we always give a tea or money. In Myanmar, we have a saying. If you just give them a tea money, everything is fine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because so it's just I did all not... like bribing. Yeah, you know, bribing. bribing. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, because of, instead of I'm not showing any uh, tea money, I just giving them or uh, answering every questions. They're giving me a very hard time. Mm -hmm. So I had a fear because I had a similar experience after 1988. But then I thought, well, we didn't do nothing wrong. I should stand up. And in fact, we're helping. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, with the help of internet these days, people seeing international community are seeing what is happening in Myanmar. And I wish for the best for the country, what's happening right now. It's not right. There's no justice at all. Mm -hmm. You know, with all this going on there and just all the work that you've done and the things that you've overcome in your life, like where do you find the courage to live the life that you've lived and to continue to do the work that you do? What is keeping that flame that you were born with? What's keeping that alive today? Yes, you you need your stubbornness, <laughs> persistence, but education. One thing that I'm very um, fortunate and I'm grateful for what my parents did to us was they sent us to a very good uh, tuition or schools. And because of that, we'd be able to get good education. Mm -hmm. Education can... Keep your eyes open. It will also help you gain more knowledge to decide what is right and what is wrong. Freedom is very important. And in my experience, I'm stubborn in some ways because I want what I believe and I stood up for my freedom. I never regretted what I did or against my parents when I was young because I was strongly believe I should deserve the same like my brother. Mm -hmm. So these are the key things you need to stand up for yourself. And also, once you have a good education, you can help your family, your friends from there, your community, and everyone. Cho Cho Nguyen. What an amazing conversation for women everywhere to recognize our power and remember never to give up on what you believe is right for yourself, your family, and for the world. Cho Cho is one of those people who inspires so many just by living her authentic path, staying dedicated to that fire within since she was a little girl and allowing her own experiences to translate into the work she does today, fighting against the injustices that she's been subjected to and changing the generational patterns for her family and greater community. I know I'm walking away inspired to stand up for myself, to link hands with other women and keep questioning and pushing back on cultural and traditional norms that promote fear and separation. Although my childhood was much different than Chocho's, there is room for improvement here in the U.S. when it comes to honoring and respecting women to the degree that I'd like to see and experience. So how do I carry that responsibility and what does it feel like to be dedicated to my own liberation as well as the collective liberation for women everywhere? 
To learn more about Studer Trust, visit studertrust.org, where you'll find the latest about international education projects and ways to get involved to support the work. A special thanks to Matthew Marsalek and the Drum Brothers, whose music you hear at the beginning and end of this podcast, as well as Jane Shinoda Bolin, who first turned us on to the phenomenon of the dandelion effect and how ideas move through the world. This podcast is a production of the Feathered Pipe Foundation, a 501c3 dedicated to healing, education, community, and empowerment. If you'd like to help support this project, please visit featheredpipe.com gratitude and leave a review on Apple Podcasts and share with friends. Positive reviews really help to get this podcast out to an even wider audience, and we'd greatly appreciate you being a seed carrier in that way. Be sure to tune in to our next episode in two weeks. We cannot wait to share another amazing conversation with you. Until then, have a beautiful day.